So welcome back to the Broncolo studio. This is the second webinar of the second series and today the topic is behind me, it's the Paras. Uh, the seminar or the webinar today has uh, three sections. In the first one I will talk about the setup, the different sizes and the compatibility of the Paras within Broncolor but as well within uh, competitive uh, lamp heads. In the second part I will talk about how to modify the light, we'll talk about uh, focusing and uh, defocusing the Para, what, uh, how this changed the light characteristic and how the distance and the angle of the Para to the object, how this influences the light. Last but not least, in the third part, um, we cover the accessories, mainly uh, diffusers. There are three diffusers available and the grids. Yes, ah, between the, these three sections, I will always uh, check, uh, check the chat if we have uh, questions about PARAS already. And if not, we just continue. And I will have a last uh, session with questions at the very end of this webinar. All right. So let's start setting up the paras. I start with the small one. By the way, I have the from the four paras we have, I have the smallest one and the biggest one here in the studio ready. The smallest one is the 88 and the biggest one is the triple two. There are two more like uh, the 133 and the 177, but they are not around to explain the system. These two are plenty. How to set up the small ones? So 88 or 133. Uh, here the recommendation is just to rotate them a little bit, this pre-opens them and then put them on a hopefully more or less clean floor and then you just use this handle, you push them down to open the para. Take two handles that are opposite of each other, not two handles that are in the right angle. So we just push them down, one, two and your para is ready for use. And I really mean this because the small paras, they have here a bronchial bayonet, which means you can put the lamp head straight in and use it as a foldable, giant, super powerful reflector, if you want. But of course, the paras, uh, the, the most important parameter to adjust the light is the focusing. So that's why I definitely prefer to use the paras always with the focusing or defocusing device. In this situation, it looks like that. Um, forget about the, the black box here. That's just the battery, because I will operate the small power with the LED F160, um, and will I, fee I will feed uh, the LED from the battery. So without this box, that's just a standard focusing device. This goes into the Broncolor bayonet. You turn it a little bit. It says click, which means you are ready to go. Put it on the stand and then very important the adapter. When you order a para it comes without the adapter. Why is this? Um, because we have different adapters. Of course the ones for Broncolor but as well for uh, other products. So make sure that if ever you order a para that you order it with the corresponding adapter. Here obviously it's the Broncolor one. Adapter goes in and then I said I'm going to show this with the LED F160. All right. And then sometimes when I'm lazy, I just have the cable like that. But uh, now, today, we make it nice. There's an opening back there. So I can put the cable out this way, connect it to the battery. And I'm already ready to shoot. So I already have plenty of light, very convenient, super compact um, tool, easy to bring on location, especially the LED, the continuous light. We never have too much continuous light, but um, sometimes we have uh, not enough continuous light. And of course, in combination with the para, you can already see it right now. There's a lot of light around in the studio to film, but um, it, the, the LED just blows this light away. Okay, so very nice combination. Very easy to set up. Let's put this aside and we take care on the big one. Um, same system for the 177 and the triple two. So as I take the Velcro away. And now when it was really squeezed, um, with the Velcro, 
Sometimes it works if you just start turning. Yep, now it works. And uh, sometimes, um, if you have stored it for quite some time, you might want to uh, climb into and just pre-open it quickly. Okay, so that we have a different angle. But if you did this, then for sure it works as simple as this. All right. Good. Then same story here. Adapter. All right. And this time the para I'm going to operate the para uh, with a flash head. In this situation it's a uni light. So squeeze it in. Here we do the same. We do it the right way around, which means the cable goes through the opening. Right. And we connect it to the power pack. Right. Now, one more word about uh, compatibility with uh, potential other lamp heads. If it's defocused, which means the lamp head is all the way out, I will talk about this more precisely in the second part of the webinar, the light that we are going to use is actually traveling from the flash tube vertically up and it's being reflected on the peripheric. Or it goes here in a right angle to the right and is then reflected to the object or to the model. Which means if I have integrated a uh, flash tube, which is inside the, the lamp head, I don't have this light. I could work with the light that goes to the, the center of the para, but you will see that if I have the lamp head defocused, there are actually no reflections from the center. So that's why it's essential that whatever you use inside, of course, best solution would be broncolor. And, but if you use something else, make sure that you have an external flash tube, otherwise you cannot use the, the full potential of the paras. All right, um, a last word in the first section, one last word about the, the surface of the reflective material. I don't know if you can see it in the video. Let me bring this one a little closer. I think we can at least guess it. So the reflective material of the, the big power is much more shiny. It's actually almost like a mirror. So when I stand here, I can almost recognize myself. However, in here, not at all. So we have somewhat more texture here on the reflective material of the small paras. The two small ones, 88 and the 133, they come with this reflector. The big ones, the 177 and the 222, come with the more shiny reflective material. Why is this? In early webinars, we learned that the hardness or the softness of the light depends on the size of the light shaper. So if we have this very aggressive reflective material and we just squeeze down the size of our para to 88 centimeters, the light would be much too aggressive. It would completely blow um, yeah, the models or the object away. So that's why uh, on the smaller paras, they are more aggressive. Then we take the aggressivity of the light a little bit by working with somewhat a more um, diffused reflector. I come back to this. At in the very last part of the webinars, because this has an influence on the accessories we can use. They actually, I, uh, my recommendation goes in different directions when you have the big paras and if we have the small paras. Okay, so now we have set them up. We talked about the different sizes, compatibility, and this means it's time for the first uh, series of questions. If you have some questions already, use the chat window on the very right side of your window and I will try to answer them right now. So, uh, like always, I forgot to explain something during the setup, and that's the usage of this device here. Adjusting the angle of a para, of a small para, is quite easy and straightforward, because it's not heavy. So, 
very simple. You just open here the, the tilt head and then you adjust the angle the way you want it, fix it again. But it can be a different story with the big paras, especially when they have a heavy lamp head like a Cirrus mounted in front. Of course, in this situation, it could be very tricky to, to fine adjust the angle. And that's why you get with the para this, um, this metallic tube with it. You normally mount it here. And then, of course, you have more power to adjust your angle precisely. I forgot to mount it because I never use it. And I never use it because I have a different device. I use this uh, tilt head. And this allows me, let's bring this a little closer, this allows me to change the angle much more simply just by, by turning it. Like this I can, even the finest adjustment, I can just make it very, very simple, very precisely like that. So it's very convenient. But as I mentioned, this is not coming with the para, so you have to order this piece additionally if you want it. Right. Um, let's keep it here just for later and I would like to talk to you about the, the, the most important parameters of adjusting the light and the first one is of course to, to focus or defocus the light. Now in the para, in the big one, I have the Unilight which is a lamp head that has no focusing possibility. So the lamp head or the, the, the flash tube is always in the same position. Here with the LED F160, that's a focusable lamp head, so I could change the, the LED distance from the lamp head. But imagine here I have, let's say, almost like a meter that I can change the lamp head's position inside the para. So an additional two or three centimeters, let's say, from a pulse G head does not change anything anymore. So you can absolutely use unfocusable lamp heads inside the para and you can still work with all the light characteristics. Let's have a look at the light when it's completely focused. Bounce it over there on this light, on this, li uh, on this wall. But first we should have a look at some graphics. Okay, so that's how a parabolic reflector works like. You see it on the, on the left, on, on the right side, we compare it with a Fresnel, uh, with a Fresnel spot, like the, the fluter or whatever. Both lighting systems, they have a focus point. And um, if the, the lamp head or the, the light source in general is on the focus point, the light leaves the reflector or the Fresnel lens parallel. And that's a huge advantage if you need a lot of light far away. If you have a very powerful uh, light setup or you need a lot of light far away, so you have to work, let's say, over large distances and you would like to dominate uh, daylight, this could definitely be uh, then the power is the first choice. And you can easily uh, shoot something like this. Um, here the setup is huge because sometimes I shoot the, the skateboard a little bit more on the right or a meter more to the left, so I don't exactly, I don't exactly know where I'm going to shoot him. Um, so that's why the light has to be far away. If the light is far away, it has less fall off over the distance and I have more flexibility um, to capture him. And as you can see, the daylight, the sun, the, the, the sunny sky with the clouds is underexposed. So I really need a lot of light here. And that's why this photograph is shot with uh, one para and one uh, P45 normal reflector. So large distances, a lot of light far away. Then we use the para focused. Uh, para has, as I said, a very high light output. And that's why it's always uh, also interesting for high-speed photography because at this situation we can work at a lower intensity. We can put the power pack or the monolight on a very low power setting and this allows to work with very short flash durations to freeze fast movements like this or like that in dance photography. Okay, so uh, a lot of light far away. This means para. I would like to show this to you um, right now quickly with this power, I first defocus it again, switch the modeling light on. Yes, you see it. 
And if it's defocused, the light is very, very evenly spread. So it's uh, obviously not coming out parallel out of the reflector, so it's uh, quite evenly spread. If you want this kind of light distribution, I still recommend that you're going for a small power, like the, the 88 or the 133. With the more textured surface, they have a even uh, more even uh, light distribution than the, the big paras. However, the big ones, of course, they have advantages when we talk about focusing, because it's a perfect parabola, highly shiny. This means we can perfectly focus them. And you see this very, very clearly when I do this. All right. So now I just focused it and you can see, of course, we have a certain perspective there on the camera, but you can see that the diameter of the para is more or less the diameter of the illuminated area. And this proves that the light really leaves the reflector more or less parallel. Okay, good. If it's focused, you can very clearly see where is the light, okay? If you put it higher up, left and right, so that's the light we see, very simple. It's a different story if we defocus it. Like this, I mean, if I look at the wall now, I don't really see a difference between this and that. So the light is very, very difficult to see in the end in the studio and that's why I want to explain how to understand the light of a defocused para better. For this I put it back in this position, right, something like this. And I have a second camera here which actually is the position of the model. So when I, when I switch to this camera, this illustrates what the model sees, or that's what you see when you go to the object position and look back to the para. Okay, let me switch the camera for this. Um, this is too bright, the modeling light is already on low, so let me close down the camera here a little bit. This would be the other direction. Okay, so maybe something like this. Okay, now we can see the light distribution much better. I have to go a little bit higher, that you're really in the center of it. Okay, good. And now you can see what I explained before. Um, as we have an external flash tube, the light does travel to the center of the reflector, but it's not reflected there. So the light now travels like this to the peripheric, and from there it travels towards the, the model. This means that we have, it's not like one light source, we have 24 spots and these 24 spots, they are illuminating my object and the position where these spots are, are very sensitive on the position of the model. For this, I first take you a little bit further away, which means um, Right now we have the diameter is more or less the distance and I take you further away. And you will see that if I do this, that the reflections are kind of falling out of the para. So the reflections would be here now, but half of them would be outside of the para and of course this is just loss of light. So there's not all the light is actually reaching the model. In this situation, if the model is further away than the diameter from the para, you have to refocus a little bit. So you have to push it back in a little bit. Exactly, so I try to show you this again from here. Okay, so that's completely defocused. Completely defocused, the reflect uh, reflections are too far out and we bring it back in a little bit. So over this distance it would be kind of perfectly defocused over the large distance. Opposite story, if we get closer, then the reflections move inside the para. You see this on both sides. Unfortunately my camera lens is too long to show the entire para over this short distance. Now it's about 1 meter 70, one and a half meter distance. And this means that the ref reflections are moving inside the para. So I'm only using it from here till here. So over 1 meter 70 distance, I'm only using 1 meter 70 in diameter. So that's why the minimum distance 
to use all light characteristics of a para would be the diameter. That's more or less here. And then if I have it here, defocus it completely, then, then that's the perfect uh, defocus position. What happens? What's the interesting part about this light? So um, even when I'm standing here in front of the light source, actually I'm not blocking any light because there's no reflections coming from behind my back. The reflections are coming from here and from there and above me. Um, this means that all these 24 lights obviously hit the center of the object, hit the center of the body, the center of the face. The light that comes from here, from up there, from down there, all these lights hit the center. But what's coming here from the right, of course, is not reaching the model's left. What's coming from the left, obviously, is not reaching the model's right. So we have a natural automatic fall off to both sides of the, of the illuminated area. This light automatically focuses in the center of the body, creating nice gradations to both sides, on left and right, but as well up and down. Because what's coming from here, up there, will of course not illuminate the area under my nose and under my chin. So as well, down here I get, I wouldn't call it shadows, but just nice fall off of the light. So defocused, it's a very, very three-dimensional light, and, but I don't have to deal with, with contrast and with positions, it happens automatically. I will show you a couple of examples right after this. Okay, um, what happens if I change the, the angle? Let's say you would like to have a, a light that comes more from, from my right. So you don't have to move these huge light shapers to the side, you simply tilt it a little bit like this. And now you see that the reflections here become much more dominant and here they are kind of falling out of the power. So now in this situation, of course, the light comes more from the right and I will have a shadow on that side. If I think the shadows are too dark, I just tilt it back a little bit. Immediately I have more light here. So it's like the main light here, fill in light there. Or I can turn it around by just putting it over there. So opposite story, the light comes from that side just a little bit of feeling light from this side. So you can give the light a little bit of a direction by just tilting the power. And again, that's not something I see very clearly when I'm standing here at, at the photographer's position. It's always the, the trick to go to the model and then look back to understand where is actually the light coming from, what can I expect when I shoot it like this. The last thing, I mean, I'm standing in front of it but I'm not blocking any light because the light is traveling around me. The, the light is not coming from the center of the power, the light is coming from the peripherics. So even when I go for a close-up of a beautiful portrait, you can see the, the light is still traveling around me. If I do the same with a softbox and I, I go from here till here, I would block much more of the softbox and I would, first of all, uh, just get a darker illumination and sooner or later I would get a, a dirty shadow in the center of the face, in the center of the figure. This does not happen with the power out there. You can really work over a very long area, over a, a lot of space. You can move freely and you always have the same light characteristics. Okay, um, I switch this one off, change the camera back to normal exposure. And I would like to show you now a couple of photographs. So that's the one we had before and this is the example that illustrates this three-dimensional lighting very, very nicely. So the only thing I have to make here is I take a rather big power, I defocus it and then I make sure that the center of the, the white dress is properly illuminated. So talking RGB values, I just make sure that we have there an exposure of maybe a 242, 243 RGB. And then the power automatically and very nicely separates the model from the white background. Of course, there I have additional light on the background, um, but the, the separation is done or happens automatically. The model can move freely. I don't have to tell her, listen, the light comes from the right. You're not allowed to turn to the left. So very, very easy to work with. I can as well get closer 
and shoot portraits. Of course, it's a different light setup, but uh, you can imagine that if you look at the reflections in, uh, in her glasses, that I could easily get a little closer and I'm still not blocking any light. So that's what I explained. You can shoot from a full body to, uh, to a portrait. Uh, look how beautifully as, as well her front head is shaped. Uh, all uh, her arms as, and as well the, the white dress, not only left, right, but as well on the shoulders. I have a nice fall off uh, to the background. So very, very easy uh, to work with this light. Same, absolutely the same technique, lighting technique as well works on objects. Here, just white espresso cups from a white background. And another thing I would like to explain about the light is the nature of the light. It's actually not one big light source that's diffused like a softbox. It's uh, 24 spotlights. And of course, there we have a different uh, appearance, a different structure, especially on semi-gloss surfaces, like here the lips, for example. It's not just one big highlight, uh, boring, dead, white or grayish area. No, it's really sparkling. So this is essential for, um, let's say, makeup photography. If you would like to show the, the quality of the skin, we can, we can use this. Uh, food photography, the, 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 the texture of a, of a broccoli, for example, for, from vegetables, of course, is a completely different appearance as if we use just a diffused softbox for this. This is a still shot out of a small, just a couple of seconds, video. Uh, that I produced and here I would uh, mention or point out that the fill-in light on the shadow side of the, the model. This is not an even fill-in light from a, from a white cardboard there. I used a, a mirror a foil and uh, as again you can see it in her eyes the, the power is defocused so it's this circular highlight and I used with a mirror uh, this circular and uneven highlight to fill in the shadows a little bit, that the shadows are not just dead, uh, but that, that there is as well something nicely happening. Okay, so um, just once again, um, when it's focused, um, the, the, the shiny ones, they can be focused more precisely than the, than the smaller ones, with, which have more texture. On the other hand, the small ones have a more even illumination when they are defocused, than the big ones. If it's focused, both uh, small and big ones, you can see the light very clearly on set because it's so powerful, the light comes out parallel. You see there it's illuminated, there the light does not reach. However, if you defocus it, once again, I recommend that you always check the light from the model's position and looking back to the para to really understand where's my light coming from, what can I expect when I shoot like this. Okay. This was about the light and the parameters to adjust it. Um, let's have a quick look if there are more questions. And if not, I will be right back with some talk about the accessories. All right, last but not least, accessories. So we already covered two accessories at the very first part of this webinar, which is adapters. Remember with adapters that you have to order them with the paras, otherwise they come without any. And the tilt head that I use mainly on the, the heavy, on the big paras. But they are accessories that are much more important for light shaping than uh, adapters and tilt heads. And these are honeycomb grids and diffusers. For this I'm going to flip the camera quickly. And what you see now here on the, on the left is still the, the same power as before, the triple two, but now with the diffuser two mounted on, uh, on it. Diffuser two has a medium density. I would like to show you the other two diffusers as well, which is number one, which has a very low optical density, a very low opacity. And these two paras, uh, no, these two diffusers, they just diffuse a certain amount of the light, but most of the light is still traveling through the diffusers. And that's why if you mount diffuser number one or two on the para, you still have the real para light, which is shaping an object or a body or a face very, very nicely. It's a different story if we talk about diffuser number three. Here we have a very high opacity a very high optical density. So when I put this one in front of the camera, you won't see through. 
you just see a white surface because that's pretty much the same material, the same density than we use in soft boxes or for soft boxes. This means that if you mount diffuser number three on a para, in my eyes, it's not really a para anymore because it's not this form giving light anymore. It's more like a perfectly round soft box, huge soft box, but you cannot focus it anymore. You can't expect this three dimensional light anymore. It's a beautiful light because it's bigger than any, uh, than any other soft box and it creates very nice shadows and so on and so on, but uh, we should not call it a power anymore. Okay, good. This is about the diffusers. Um, why do I not want to show grids on the big power? We have seen before that when I focus it, that the illuminated area on the wall has about the same diameter like the light shaper itself. This means that the light comes out in a light angle of almost like a 5 or 10 degrees, very, very narrow. So it doesn't really make a lot of sense if you have a reduced light angle to put on honeycomb grids because honeycomb grids are reducing the light angle and if we have 10 degrees of light angle from the light shaper itself and we put on a 40 degrees grid doesn't change a lot it still changes a little bit to be honest because it makes the edge transfer a little sharper so it's still actually more spotty the light um, but it's not as essential as with the small paras. And then you can say, yeah, but I would like to use the grids when I defocus the para. And this um, doesn't really make a lot of sense either. Why? The light in the defocus position travels from the lampade to the peripheric and then in a certain angle back to the object. And angled light, so light that does not want to leave the reflector vertically, but in a certain angle, that's exactly this light that's blocked by honeycomb grids. So it's actually contraproductive to defocus a para and to put the grids on. So that's why it makes a lot of sense to have one or two diffusers for the para, for the big ones, like the 177 and the triple two, but the grids mainly make sense on the small one. Why? Um, I mentioned before that the small ones, they have more diffusion, so we have a less aggressive uh, reflective material, so that texture always is the same, like less controlled. So if we would like to focus the PARA 88 completely, we expect something like an illuminated area, uh, area that has the same diameter like the light uh, shaper itself, so we expect uh, a light point of about one meter diameter. And it, this will not be the case because we have some diffusion already from the reflective material. And that's why with the small paras, it makes a lot of sense to limit the light angle, especially in the defocused, uh, sorry, of course, uh, the grids make sense in the focused position. So we focus it already, but we still have some diffusion and then the grids are limiting the light angle even more. So that's the reason why diffuser for the aggressive large paras and the grids for the kind of less controlled, little bit uh, softer, small paras. The, we can put it that way, that the diffuser brings the big paras a little bit more towards the small ones from the light characteristic, while the grids allow us to focus even the small paras as precisely as the big paras. So they are both pushing each other in the direction of the other para. So that's why in my eyes, mainly grids on the small ones, diffusers on the large ones. They are mounted the same way. So we have here these extensions um, from, the, from the rods that keep the power open. And these rods are used um, to mount and to tension the power very, very nicely. And this is very precisely done. So if I rotate the power for you, you will see that it's very nicely, it's completely flat surface, so it's a very precise light shaper despite of the size, the, the shape of the power re remains the same, it's not like wrinkled, at the same time the tension of the fabric as well is just perfect. Here the same, we have an, uh, an elastic band around the, the grids and again we use just these small extensions here to mount the grids on. To take it off, very very simple, just like that. Um, it's a textile grid, so you can easily fold it, throw it in the car, 
uh, can't break, can't wrinkle, so very easy to handle. Right, so far about uh, the paras, the handling, light characteristics, the parameters to adjust the light accessories. Now I'm going to check once more if you have any questions. So um, if still something is unclear, please ask now. Last chance.